So, Carl, is it snowing where you are? How did you know? <laughs> I don't know. I just had this funny feeling. I know it's cold where we are. Yeah. My uh, virtual background is uh, snow, and then none of it's sticking on me, and I'm wearing a T-shirt. It's really- Black T-shirt, too. Kind of amazing. Awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, you're always warmer if you wear a black T-shirt, because it absorbs <laughs> <laughs> it absorbs the heat- if there was any heat, hey, by the way, before we get started, I want to wish you both you guys and our listeners a happy Chris Mahana Kwanzaadaan. Appreciate it. <laughs> happy uh, Festivus. I'd wish you the same thing if I could actually say that. <laughs> <laughs> So what the heck happened last week? Yes. Yeah. I guess it's this week because this is security this week. Right. Not security last week. So if you've been in solitary confinement for the last week you could and you guessed Log4j, you would be right. Yeah. That's still happening. Yeah, we had talked about it a while ago. We had already said there was going to be fallout for weeks and weeks and months to come. And there's still plenty of fallout and interesting vectors. And we're still adding links to episode 21. The internet is burning. <laughs> right. But we'll add them in both places. So I guess the FBI uh, wants you. Yes. Wants to help you. Yeah. They're from the government. They're here to help. It, it, quite literally. So there's a story uh, seeking victims of Log4j vulnerability. The FBI and the Department of Homeland Security Cybersecurity and in Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, we talked about that before, are working jointly in response to the ongoing threat associated with Log4j. And if you believe that a malicious cyber actor or actors have exploited this vulnerability on your network, please fill out this form on the internet. Or if you just have a network. <laughs> yeah, right. Pretty much you can assume you've been breached. Uh, you know what? I've, I've been relatively impressed with um, CIS's response to this. They're very um, good. Honestly, yeah. they have been very vocal, very out there working with different agencies and departments, um, you know, very much on all social medias and Twitter and that sort of stuff. But not only that, um, they have a, a GitHub that's continually evolving. Um, they put up a log4j scanner up there hmm. where they've they've literally said, listen, the cybersecurity community is doing an awesome job of putting together scanners and little tools and that sort of stuff. And we wanted to bring them all together and make sure they're all secure and make sure they're doing what they should be doing. And so they're, they're, we'll put a, a link up for that, too. So if you're looking, scan but go to the official site. Don't just click on some link that someone sent you. Mm. Yeah, we, we'll put a link on our site, even though we say not to click on links. But it will be uh, github.com slash cisagov slash log4j dash scanner. Um, but we'll put a link up so you'll you'll see that. So, you know, if you're still looking to do some scanning to see if internal applications are vulnerable or websites are vulnerable, et cetera, there's, there's a lot of options out there. So I've been actually been on, I've, I've met a lot of people from CISA and it's a very impressive group. I, I find it to be the silver lining in the, the cyber war that we're getting serious because I haven't wow. met anybody from CISA that I haven't found to be very competent. Wow, that's cool. Good group of guys and gals. All right, so if you get a scanner and you find that you have vulnerabilities, what version should you be using? Trick question. Oh, that is a trick question. What so, version of Log4j? Yeah. 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 So initially, everybody was 2.14 and we said, oh my gosh, go rush out to 2.15. Right. Um, and, then, and then 2.15 has issues. So they said, oh my God, let's rush out and do 2.16. And 2.16 has a data leak and a denial of service, I believe. So now everybody's saying, oh my gosh, go rush out and do 2.17. It's safe to say right now <laughs> that if you have any log4j issues that you found, you should just every day check to see if there's a patch of some sort. Yeah. Probably <laughs> apply it. Right. And if you can do without the system, do without the system. Shut yeah. it off. Yep. And we've had a couple customers do that where mm. um, they've had an externally vulnerable system. And instead of playing around with it, they've decided to shut it off and, and wait for the dust to settle before they bring it back up. It, it could be weeks, though. Yes. Hmm. So I have a question. Uh, is Log4j the vulnerability it or is it getting worse? As people start discovering the different attack vectors for log4j, they're starting to see that the breadth is wider than we had thought. Um, so little things like 
let's assume you have an application, for example, sitting on the inside of your network. Okay. Um, so not accessible to the internet, not need really even worried about somebody connecting to it and running a log4j you know, exploit and getting access to all sorts of things. It's not connected to data that users might supply from the internet. So you might think to yourself, I'm safe. Right. right. I, don't need to, I don't need to worry about log4j because nobody literally supplies data to this system that's touching the Internet. Mm. Um, but there's a brand new uh, vector that came out. If you take a look at the, the links for the show notes uh, from the Hacker News. OK. Um, that actually talks about malicious websites. So if I were to get you to click on a website, um, it can download malicious JavaScript that will then use Java web sockets internally to then exploit log4j internally. Oh, so man. I, you'll browse the website, and then your browser will go out and scan the internal network looking for and hack your different for types. How, of, yeah, exactly. How is that even possible? Shouldn't the browsers disable local sockets activity? So you would think so, depending on what types of calls you're making. Um, there are always ways to bypass. Honestly, you know, I feel bad for all of the web application firewall vendors out there. Yeah. They have had a heck of a time trying to block just straight up log for J, uh, J and D I calls because there are so many ways to swizzle that string so that it doesn't look like the normal, you know, squirrely brace J and D I colon, whatever. Um, that it's just hard to pass. I don't really know what JNDI is, but I'm I'm assuming that it's some sort of protocol that you use to access log4j. Yes, yeah, and that's that's the crux of this whole log4j vulnerability is through this JNDI protocol, I can load up a remote class from a remote server and say, "Hey, I just want to run whatever this code is." And that's that's where we're seeing all these breaches is you're pulling down a Java class that gives you system access or gives you a command prompt or which is very convenient sure very convenient. and as we know convenience. convenience is the enemy of security yeah uh yeah and we talked about that last week with the whole uh, and i know we don't have a story on it this week but with mm. the whole um sam account breach yep or active directory networks you know it's convenient maybe to have a user be able to add a, a computer to a domain um however now we're finding it's it's a bad idea and I went out and updated the firmware for all my routers and everything, you know, being a good doobie. So I'm hopeful that uh, we'll have a safe new year at the well, Franklin House. you got to make sure you don't go to websites you shouldn't be going to. I don't you got to do make that sure anyway. that you're not clicking on emails you shouldn't be clicking on. I don't do that. But- <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's tough. I mean, especially this time of year, most people hopefully are on guard um, because we're all receiving emails from – Either, you know, Best Buy or Target or whoever saying, hey, there's this new deal or there's this Black Friday deal or there's Mm. these coupons or whatever. So just be careful what you click on and what you're expecting and not expecting. Hey, so let's talk about Belgium. (laughs) This is a feel good story, Carl. I I know. It's a wonderful story. (laughs) And it's in the Brussels Sprouts Times. No, I'm sorry. That's not the name of the paper. I just uh, I'm a little hungry right now. It's the Brussels Times. Belgian Defense Ministry Network partially down following cyber attack isn't that awesome awesome. (laughs) so you might say why is this a feel-good story um there are a lot of small to medium companies right now and and even some larger companies who are really struggling with log 4j and and thinking oh my gosh you know this is this is such a hard task um and you know i always like to point out it's not just you um so here we see this is a defense ministry yeah you know, d- division of the government who had to shut down their own networks for for a similar problem. They had a you know an exploit from Log4j, and they had to shut down their systems and and not have them be available. So, so we have different think- definitions for feel good. Well, you know, I think what Dwayne is saying is if <laughs> if you think you're inconvenienced and you think you got it bad, and you're feeling stupid because you missed uh, an attack. Yeah, mm-hmm. but a lot of people are going to take the lesson of. If they can't defend themselves, what hope do I have? Well, that's the way Are I look at it, Are you saying I'm a Pat. positive? <laughs> Dwayne's like, awesome. <laughs> this is great. Even governments are toppling. And Dwayne, like, don't travel to Belgium anytime Dwayne? soon. I think you just made a list. <laughs> I've been on list before. It's okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. So, yes, we're going to see this 
more and more. I don't think we have much more or really anything else on this podcast, but we're going to keep we're going to keep an eye on Log4j. We're going to see how it spiders out into all different types of vectors and and breaches and we'll try and keep you guys up to date as to what's and, going on. You know, it's going to be awesome. It is going to be awesome. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. So, so Dwayne, I, I think the back. feel I think I think the feel good <laughs> thing is they actually patched it and they're yes. back online. Yes, That's and they're great. they're up and back online. That's the positive. So yeah. we went through a minor version of this with like print nightmare and the exchange on premise server problems and and these were pernicious problems that kept the patches kept getting, oh, it's a patch and it solves most of the problem, but not all the problem. Oh, it's a patch and it fixed most mm-hmm. of the problem, but not all the problem. And we lived that for a few weeks and they were very esoteric and they were very marginalized. This is much more generalized. So this is the same yeah. kind of thing. This thing happens, this kind of thing happens all the time, but the more widespread the thing is, the bigger the problem is. Like if we found out that suddenly there was a problem with all spoons, that would be a big deal. Right, but if you found out there was a problem with fancy salad cake forks, eh, maybe not you know, so big a deal. You think you're making a joke, but I read a very compelling story at spoonsareevil dot com, uh, and <laughs> fancy salad cake forks. What I've been doing my own research. You eat? <laughs> I love that you hear your friends and say, I've been doing my own research. All right, genius. <laughs> right, and you're the, fully you qualified. Over? Because I remember you failed sociology in high school. <laughs> yeah. uh, the guy that bought a term paper. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you hear, uh, uh, you know, over the holidays, you might get together with your family. If somebody says, I've been doing my own research, <laughs> you, you, uh, <laughs> translate that as, you know, I follow this wacko on Facebook and you know this wacko to hear that? says – your doctor. Your doctor loves yeah. to hear that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Go to your doctor with a stack of printouts from websites. Uh, right, right. That's going to be great. To, uh, it's going to go well. The Google School of Medicine. Or just uh, yeah, reality. You know, so I, I always wonder what to think about when you get these articles, like when you get something that's as prolific as Log4j. Mm. There's a guy on my team, on the red team, who's, um, whose mom actually texted him. This is, hey, this log4j thing, something we need to worry about, which yeah. is awesome in one case because oh, so she's awesome. not in technology. She's not right. And it's, it's made it to such mainstream that everybody's worried about it. Dwayne, let's hear it for mom's anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> That's he said, awesome. As as he said, as long as she's only playing Call of Duty, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he told her to shut down her Minecraft server, but other than that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's you know from from that standpoint though it's it's good that this type of news doesn't get brushed under the rug as too technical for the general population. Yeah. But in another sense, what if you don't have that son who's on an advanced red team who understands all these things? Like, yeah. paranoia might build up as well. So I'm right. I'm torn as to whether it's great that it's in the wide media or not. I think yeah. the luddites are going to have a comeback. Revenge of the luddites. <laughs> right. This is going to be something that is remembered in the culture for, for decades. Like Luddite. Sure. Because, yes, exactly. Just like Luddite. Because it's such a big widespread problem and it's going to keep, it's the gift that's going to keep on giving. Right. Eventually we'll get control of it, but it's going to be in the news cycle for, for months. This is the COVID-19 of security right here. It's the solar winds of this year. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. but where, I guess, where does this fall? Like, Something like SQL injection has, you know, lived the the course of time. What's it been on the OWASP top ten list for the last two hundred years? Yeah, because it's a technique that can be leveraged in any sort of database lookup mm. type system. Whereas mm-hmm. this is just a library. Right. So does does this distill down into one of the great techniques of okay, yeah, you really need to be careful when you're loading dynamic code from now. You know, eventually everybody will be software. patched. And we'll right. forget all and about it. Does it go away? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there is one more uh, Log4j story before we move on. This is from Go Secure, December 21st. And uh, Log4j 2.15 TOCTOU. And I don't know what that is. Is that just the Log4j vulnerability? It's a time of check, time of use. Oh, okay. Uh, and it says it's illustrated. The vulnerability is illustrated by Go Secure researchers. Uh, Log4j has been in the spotlight for the past two weeks for a new attack vector 
which relies on Java Naming and Directory Interface, or JINDI, J-N-D-I, which we were just talking about. Uh, Log4j 2.15 vulnerabilities are now considered high severity, 9.0, and as the Go Secure research team investigated, we realized that the mitigations implemented were incomplete. So the blog details the new mitigation introduced in 2.15, and the bypass they found using a time of check, time of use vulnerability. This, this is what Dwayne and I was referring to earlier, where it's like they fixed it and then they realized, oh, that doesn't really fix it. And then they fixed it. And then they'll, uh, yeah, that doesn't really fix it. We went through that with Print Nightmare as well. So it's yeah, going to go through the stutter steps. Yeah. yeah. And, and in this one, I mean, the current recommendation is, you know, upgrade to 217. But, you know, on that next week's show, if I can't guarantee that we're not going to say, hey, upgrade to 218 or 219. I'd, or, I'd take action that we're going to have to say that. Yeah. For throw away log for Jane entirely. Which is why I, I really do recommend if you can shut off the system and ride this out with it off, do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I have a bunch of people in sort of my tech circle that are software vendors and they've They've said, you know what, we have to patch because we're 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 releasing software with these libraries contained in them, so we don't have the ability to shut it off, right? And 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 then there's the trouble of, well, I have other customer, I have some of my customers who are running older versions of our software, hmm. right? What's the recommendation of those people? Because sometimes you know it could be exploited and not logged, etc. And it's like, well, the recommendation is to upgrade. Problem yeah. there is production upgrades aren't a you know go out and install a production upgrade right now. It takes time and planning and testing and so, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a, it's going to be interesting for a while. Yeah. And I, I have been told, I have a customer who I uh, I talk to quite a bit, um, and I have been told I need to dial down the fact that I'm so excited mm. every time some <laughs> of these things happen. <laughs> no, he said, he's like, oh, it's awesome. Every time I hear something that, that gets you excited, I know it's Horrible. it's all hands on deck and I should be in the corner somewhere crying. Yeah. <laughs> So, hey, as it turns out, as we are recording this on the 23rd, uh, Vladimir Putin is doing his annual press conference where he answers. He has like these marathon four-hour end-of-year press conferences every year. And Is he putting out the word? No, I was going to say he was Putin on the glitz. <laughs> oh, not Putin on the Ritz? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... So as this press conference is going on, there's a, a couple of days ago, there's a story that uh, Russian hackers made millions. Oh, yeah. By stealing SEC, Security Exchange Commission, earning reports from U.S. companies. Yep. Russian insider, hackers made millions. Insider trading, basically. Get oh, yeah. Information, it, and then you know what the news is and. You can trade based on it. You can short or you can buy and you know what the price is going to do. So this is not really a case of having an insecure computer system as you have an insecure system of people that, you know, somebody obviously gave this person access. Yeah. So this this one's frustrating. So yeah. this is uh, the people who perpetrated this crime um, and they're they're named in the article. We can we'll put a link to it. Mm hmm. Um, they are, they actually work for a pen testing red team company in Russia. Wow. So they, they work for a cybersecurity firm doing cybersecurity pen testing, et cetera. These are the people who, and we'll go on and talk more about ethics and all sorts of other things, but to talk about a little bit about the technicality of what was going on here, um, the, these, uh, people went through the people from this security company. Mm. Went through and were able to take breached user accounts, so usernames and passwords that they found for this. Um, there was a central SEC filing company that they had breached. And they breached it over a VPN. They had one user's username, valid username and password, and they VPNed into the company with using that username and password. And mm. they were able to then glean uh, earnings reports before they were released for companies like IBM, Steel Dynamics, Avnet, Tesla, Box, Roku, Kohl's, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And then they could either short the stock or not, depending on you know what what the earnings reports look like they were going to do. Um, so that's the that's the technicality here is you know 
they breach just to use your name and password and able to get into this company and, and so if you were it. down on Martha Stewart for insider trading of what thirty thousand dollars or something like that oh right this is uh you know these are the people you should be angry at so yeah, I, and- I have a story from about twenty years ago that that hasn't changed about twenty years ago a friend of mine uh was talking to me about he had these Eastern European developers, and I believe they were out of Russia, um, who were developing a, a banking system. And I said, that's not a mistake. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, if you're going to have the Russians build a banking system, you have to have a line by line audit to make sure they don't put a back door in. Right. And he's like, well, you know, we have contracts. I said, it's all about laws. It's about whether you could get them extradited. And I don't think you could. So he, I, I scared him enough. And I put enough doubt that he had a line by line audit and found three back doors into the system wow. that they had built into the system. Wow. And when he confronted them by it, they said, okay, well, if we take them out, can we keep going forward? They, they weren't, they weren't Are you embarrassed. Kidding? They, no, wow. I swear. And, um, it, it's really, you've got to think about the legal ramifications for what, where you're working with people. And I hate to say this, but if you, if you don't have the ability to prosecute the people you're hiring to test your security and write your code, then your code's not secure. There's one thing that you can do as a modern software developer, and we all know this now. That was 20 years ago. But now we have things like GitHub and uh, places where where we can have our source code repository actually build and publish the code. And GitHub in particular, and I think um, some of the other – uh, repositories as well, they will go through all the code that is uh, uploaded, you know, put in the repository and sort of notify you of anything that's suspicious looking. Anything they can find. And um, it, yes, that is a good find. mitigation. Yeah. Um, then about once a week on average, we're doing an application pen test where we're looking at a web a- application, whether it integrates with Salesforce or Shopify or whatever. Mm. And about half of the time, they come up clean on all the automated tools and we still find something devastating. Yeah. To the point that in the last two months, I think we've gotten three vendors blacklisted by the customers that hired us to do those assignments. Wow. Because the, the, the failings were so catastrophic. And these are failings not found by any automated tool because we run the automated tools first. But then we we have people actually poke around at the code and we find things that are very exploitable. And so it's an arms race. It's not, we're not going to, we're not going to have a killing blow against these people. You've got to think about a, a layered strategy, which includes what you said, yeah. it includes automated tools, right? but it also includes what, what motivates this developer to not do this. Well, prison is a real motivation. And if the developers in China or Russia, they, they don't have that fear. Yeah. Right. They have fear of uh, starving to death. That's it. Yeah. Well, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very uplifting holiday episode of Security Merry this Christmas. Week. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. So if you're if you're a company and you're looking for a cybersecurity team mm-hmm. from the outside to pen test, red team, right? How do you then if how do you then pick a, a company that you know is not going to then come? Well, you in obviously and, pick Pat and Duane. And well, uh, yeah, of course. I, I mean, unfortunately, most of the people in our industry. Our criminals. <laughs> it's it's tough, right? Because you have to have people in the industry who 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 have the mindset to know how they might steal millions and millions and millions of dollars from unwitting companies and people, right. but then have the morals to not do that. Right. And and maybe even the hey, I really want to help some of these people as much as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. So it's it's tough. It's a balancing um, act. You gotta yeah. you gotta make sure that you're dealing with people who one you can prosecute. If they cross the line, which means they've got to be either in the United States, Canada, or some place that you can reach out, which which increases the price, unfortunately. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to try to outsource security yeah. much outside the borders, let alone outside the West. And then the other side of it is you need to find out who you're dealing with and exactly who who you're dealing with and what their background is. Some people come to this through the military or through, you know, love of technology and through other me- you know, legitimate means, but some of them come here through the court system. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin Mitnick is a, is a luminary in the security space, but he spent a good amount of time on the most wanted list. <laughs> right. Mm. Well, we have one more story and one opinion piece. So I guess we'll start with the Ubisoft story. 
Yeah. Uh, first this of all, one, what is what is Ubisoft? They're just the greatest software developer in the world. Okay. <laughs> so they're a game company. Um, and they put out all sorts of fantastic games. If if you guys haven't checked out Ubisoft stuff, um, you should, because uh, they have some really good games out there. Um, so what's interesting about this data breach um, is we've been hearing a lot about um, you know, ransomware attacks. We've been hearing a lot about uh, Log4j, which is, you know, zero day exploits hitting hitting the web before mm-hmm. companies can mitigate them. Um, this one, honestly, was just infrastructure error. Uh, and it happens, right? A misconfiguration of some some sort that gave unauthorized individuals access to possibly copy information for users and that would that included gamer tags profile ids device ids uh just dance videos just that were dance <laughs> it's one of their titles where you can you can uh follow along and and dance and then share your your dance video out the, the name of the game is also the instruction manual <laughs> So if you find some fantastic just dance videos on me out there, you'll you'll know why. Um, but it's it you know it's one of those cautionary tales of you really do need to keep everything patched. You really do need to keep an eye on the the pulse of cybersecurity. But there's there's also all sorts of other moving parts out there, and you know configuration just misconfiguration is sometimes more devastating than these zero day attacks. Well, um, it's in this in the physical security world, it's like leaving a gate open. Sure. It's not. It's not that you know somebody breached the fence or came through the wall or, or dug a or tunnel, defeated a lock. You left the gate open. Yeah. Right. Right. And and unfortunately, we see more often than not when we breach systems, it's we're not. Although sometimes we do invent you know new malware and zero days and that sort of stuff to breach a customer to see how their incident response team handles it. We find more often than not it's misconfigurations that allow us to get access to the companies. Well, the old adage is that. The defender has to be right a thousand times. The hacker has to only be right once. Right. Mm. Yep. New catchphrase. Yeah, right. And uh, finally, we get to this uh, uh, opinion piece in InfoSecurity magazine. And this piece uh, exhibits one of my absolute pet peeves about blog posts or news posts or whatever. There's no freaking date on it. And it yes. makes me angry when I see this kind of stuff because it's so easy just to put a date. And by not doing that, you may be, you know, pushing bad information. And what I mean by that is over time, things change and somebody comes and reads this in 10 years and it may or may not be relevant and it may be even wrong. So, and it, in this case, it's, it's, pretty benign I, I think there is but, a date uh, are you talking about the jack jack oh you know piece? what i see it it's so faint it's hard to see nine december 2021 okay i stand corrected but yeah the date is hard to see but but your rant is still stands it's yes. still valid just not for this argument. it's a valid rant uh however it doesn't apply jack. we have forgive we forgive jack yeah so jack chapman vp of threat intelligence for egress the 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 title of the post is crime as a service is leveling up and businesses aren't prepared. And by leveling up, I think he means it's on the rise. It's not that they're coming clean. (laughs) All right. I'm going to level up with you. Uh, (laughs) That is not what that means. That is not what that means. No. Well, and this, this is interesting because a lot of people assume that for you to breach a company, you need to be the most technical, brilliant minded, malware developer on the planet who's invented something that nobody's ever seen before and then deployed it in such a secret way that you've breached this company and they have no idea what's going on. That's you, basically. It's a day at the office for for Dwayne. (laughs) And that's a Tuesday. (laughs) Um, But honestly, the way that that a lot of these global cyber crime syndicates are operating at this point, it's it's literally, they operate like a normal business. If they need... if, If we... At our company needed access to more customers, we could go purchase a list. Right. And we could find a list of customers who are in our space who are looking for a particular thing, maybe, you know, red team engagement, whatever it may be. Um, and then we could find out information about that company and we could then target them specifically. 
right? As a sales or it's a sales organization. Right. This is the same thing in the cyber world right now. If you want to breach a company, you can buy a, a dark web OSINT list on a particular company, which would be all the employees, where they live, kids' names, you know, uh, their cars, VIN numbers, you name it. All the information about this company so I can have targeted phishing campaigns, spear phishing campaigns, whaling campaigns against these people. Well, that's been going on for 10 years in the form of breaches on the dark web too. No, agreed, 100%. But it's just weird how, not weird, but... We should all see this coming that, you know, it, it's, it's now just big business. It's like a normal every, it's like going out and buying an iPhone. Instead, you're going out and you're buying a list on a particular company because you're looking to breach them. More career advice from security this week. Yeah. For, for <laughs> you don't need to be the uber technical hacker. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy you a list. You too can be a hacker yep. if you have money. Uh, you, can, you can use a virus creation kit. You can then have that virus tested now by a company who has full QA staff and tell you what to do to fix your virus. You can then purchase uh, access to a botnet and you can deploy your virus over the botnet and all of that without knowing how to do any uh, single line of code. That also puts you more vulnerable to law enforcement when they break, when they bring down that provider, you may get picked off along with them pat don't because tell maybe, them that we're trying to give them career advice i'm trying i'm right. trying to keep them from joining the uh the, the network of the damned <laughs> and being on the good side so it's it is just it's interesting that it's it almost seems just transactional at this point yeah. like oh whatever you want you know so you want this type of data you want yeah it, we're not gonna it's not gonna stand still and we can't stand still but it's it's an evolving threat i remember when i was first heard about um, denial of service as a service. And that's yep. the direction that, that was the beginning of this. And that was, that was years ago. Mm. Right. So but in other what, words, Hey, do you want me to flood your, your competitor's website with so many requests that, that it brings their computers to a halt, you yeah. know, 10 grand. Yeah. Right. We'll do it. Yeah. And, and when they rolled up some of those networks, in some cases, they got some of their customers. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's been, that's the, one of the things that's helped slow it down a little bit, but we are going to a commoditized, specialized world where, where the threats of non-qualified hackers will become amplified. That's, that's I think, the message here. So, but it's, it is interesting how that this business has followed the same cadence and, and sort of tactics as just normal business, right? Yeah. So in, in, in normal business, I, you know, I used to work for software vendors and that sort of stuff. And we always knew when we acquired a customer, it was easier to sell to an existing customer, a new piece of software, a new add on, whatever, than it was to acquire a, a new customer, net new customer. It just, it would cost less, et cetera. Same thing in the ransomware world. Right. So uh, this particular article says research has shown that 80 percent of organizations hit by ransomware are targeted by further attacks. Forty six percent of them are targeted by the same cyber criminals who hit them originally. Right. Like, oh, I already know that you're going to click on these things. I already know what your defenses are and I know you're going to pay. So let's just continue to keep sending you more more malware and continue to another justification for making paying ransoms illegal. Yeah, I hear you. All right. So more of the same. More of the same this week. I think uh I think that's a show. It, it, it's kind of a short show, but you know what? Uh, it's the holiday season. So what are you doing listening to security this week when you should be with your family and uh drinking too much and slamming doors and and being passive aggressive? Agreed. Cuz they want to use the internet. So that's why they're trying. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Have a good one. Thanks. Yeah. Happy holidays. Yeah. Happy uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa.